morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Union Baptist Church. We're so glad you're here with us this morning. Let's all stand together as we sing, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Jesus is the sweetest name I know, and he's just the same as his lovely name, and that's the reason why I love him so. Oh, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Let's sing that one more time. Jesus is the sweetest name I know, and he's just the same as his lovely name, and that's the reason why I love him so. Oh, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Amen. Be seated. Good morning. I'm Chase. I'm the associate and student pastor here at Union Baptist. If you're visiting with us this morning, uh, and we are so glad to have you. I got a few announcements this morning, and then I'll get into um, uh, some scripture I wanted to share with us. But uh, uh, we have a Braves game. If you guys seen the announcements, May the 22nd, we're taking the youth. I saw six to 12th graders uh, that are want to come. We are going to the Braves game. Uh, and our adults are needed. That's Saturday, May the 22nd at 4 o'clock. So if you would love to come to Chaperone or you just want an excuse to go to a Braves game, there you go. Uh, you now have one. Uh, we're going to take a couple cars down there for the game. But the sign-up sheet is outside on in the foyer. If you want to sign up on that, uh, please do so quickly. we got a, a short turnaround on it uh, because tickets will sell out. So we want to be able to get some good seats for everybody who's wanting to go on that. Also, if you have a youth that's interested in camp, uh, that's 6th to 12th grade this summer, July the 11th through the 17th. If you're interested in going on that, we have one spot available. Uh, so please tell your youth to see me or uh, if you're a parent, see me about that and we'll get them signed up for that as well. Uh, a Bible verse this morning I would love to share with you guys comes from Romans chapter 8, verse 1. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that is, uh, that's great news this morning. What that means is that who I was five years ago, 10, 20, 30, 50, for whoever, that means uh, that person that we used to be before Christ. Those things that we used to do. None of those things to find us anymore. The thing that defined us, uh, defines us is the grace and mercy of Jesus, and we can uh, we can celebrate that and be thankful for that this morning. If you would, join me in prayer. Father God, thank you so much for allowing us to gather together. Thank you for your grace and mercy, God. Uh, Lord, I thank you that... Um, for the price that you paid for us, God. Uh, you paid a debt that uh, that we couldn't pay, God. And we don't deserve it, but may our lives reflect that. May we have gospel-saturated lives. That when we leave here, that we're able to love others differently and act differently because of what you've done in our life. May that be a reflection of who you are. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's continue worshiping the Lord as we sing, Oh, worship the King. Let's stand together. And children, you can head over to Children's Church. sing of his grace whose robe is the light whose canopy space his chariots of wrath the deep thunder clouds form and dark is his path on the wings of the storm thy bountiful care what tongue can recite it breathes in the it shines in the light It streams from the hills It descends to the plain And sweetly distills In the dew and the rain Frail children of dust And feeble as frail In thee do we trust Nor find thee to fail 
mercies, how tender, how firm to the end. Our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. Amen. Be seated. Amen. Y'all sounding good singing this morning. And you even look sharp, too. It's good to have you here this morning. We do have a lot of people out, as you can see today, between the stomach bug and seasonal allergies. We've got a lot of people who are sick, so we need to remember them in prayer. But I'm glad that you're here this morning. If you're glad to be here, would you say I am? I'm glad that you're here, too. I, I noticed something this morning I thought was pretty interesting. For the first time uh, in my pastoral ministry life, about 20 years now, it's the first time I've ever drove into a church parking lot and everybody had the same color car. Everybody's car is green and yellow this morning. It's kind of weird looking, but uh, I, I'm glad that your car is here no matter what color that it is. Let me go over a couple of quick announcements with you this morning and then we're going to spend some time together in prayer. First of all, if you're a guest here with us, whether you're here in person or watching online, we're thankful for our online audience as well. We want to thank you for being here. We're honored that you choose to worship with us. It's a big deal to us, and we don't take that for granted. We pray that you experience the love of Christ today. A couple of quick things do want to share with you. Easter Sunday is next week. Now, we're going to have a little schedule change next week for Easter Sunday. We're going to be having a worship service, just one worship service, at 1030 next Sunday morning. So there's no Sunday school next week, just one worship service at 1030. If you come at 11, that's on you. All right? 1030. And some of y'all that live on Union time, you, I'm going to tell you, worship at 10, all right? Worship at 10 next week to get you here when you need to be here. But worship at 1030 next Sunday. We will not be having Sunday school, just one worship service at 1030. Our choir will be singing uh, next week as well, be preaching the gospel. I want to encourage you to invite somebody to join you, uh, preferably someone who does not know Jesus. Going to be sharing the gospel next week. We've got baptisms next week. We're always extraordinarily thrilled uh, to see people take that next step. And there's, there's still time, too. If you've not been baptized, if you've not been baptized by immersion after your conversion, your salvation, please talk with us. We'd love to share baptism with you and share what that means. And we'll dunk you, too, on Sunday. We'd look forward to doing that. So we got baptism starting off our service next week. And the baptisms will be promptly at 1030. All right? Not 11. Not 1034. But at 1030. That's when we're going to start our services. I'm going to just mention Travis Burris. We've got 1030, brother. The Travis. That's what <laughs> 1030 is where we're going to have our worship service next week, so do keep that in mind. Our Annie Armstrong Easter offering is still going on right now. You can continue to give. We've almost got to our goal. I encourage you to give towards Annie Armstrong Easter offering. That's from North American Missions. We complain about North America. We complain about America, the shape that we're in. Give towards the Annie Armstrong Easter offering because the only thing that's going to change North America and America itself is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this offering gets missionary on the field right here in our nation. So that's going to be going towards that. Uh, there's some offering envelopes there in the for you if you'd like to give towards uh, the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Uh, we have our community Easter egg hunt that we're in partnership with several other churches. Uh, and some, I've already been asked, are we still having that? Because we're expecting some rain to come in this afternoon. They have said rain or shine. We're hunting Easter eggs with the community this afternoon at 4 o'clock in downtown Ivo. Now we're going to be handing out our church is handing out some uh, some frisbees that have the gospel on them, and we hopefully have some gospel conversations. That's our prayer, just just ministering to and serving our community. If you'd like to help with that, there are several of you have said you can. That'd be great. Uh, you meet me at 3:30 at the gazebo, and you can get all the information there. 3:30 at the gazebo to help out with that. Again, that's rain or shine. There's going to be hot dogs. Everything's free. Uh, serving our community with other churches, so that is going on as well. Thank you for all the candy. Donations nations that have been brought in. We've got a lot of it, and that's going to be important because this Wednesday night there is a egg packing party. Uh, and that's going to be the WMUGAs and actings. Now we're still having our regular services as well. Youth are still having their service. We'll still have our adult Bible study in the book of Revelation. Hey, we've made it all the way to chapter 14 in a year's time on Wednesday night. So we're going to be in 14 this week. But all of the normal activities will be going on, but there'll be an egg packing party with our GAs and actings on Wednesday night. And 
that's going to serve our moonlight Easter egg hunt that's going to be happening next Saturday at 7 p.m. Supper's going to be served. Bring your Easter baskets and your flashlights. It'll be a lot of fun. Invite your neighborhood kids, invite your grandkids, whoever you can. We want to serve a community in that way. We're going to have a good time as we celebrate the Lord together. We're continuing this morning in our Just Jesus sermon series that we uh, have been in for the last several weeks and uh, looking forward to seeing what God is going to do. Now here's what we also understand. Jesus said that his house would be a house of what? Prayer. Prayer. Most important thing that we could do this morning is pray. So I'm going to ask our deacons, I'm going to ask our staff, anybody else who would like to join us at the altar this morning. We want to enter a time of prayer. If you've got a need this morning, would you come? Uh, maybe you say, I don't, I don't know exactly what I should be praying for. Let me give you something to pray for. Pray for me this morning as I preach the gospel. Uh, pray that the Holy Spirit would move. Pray that some might be saved. Join us at the altar this morning if you have a need. Just a few moments we'll spend in private prayer and then I'll lead us in pastoral prayer. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to be able to gather together with the body of Christ this morning and lift high the name of Jesus. We do that today, Lord, and, and we don't do it as perfect people, but people who have been forgiven, people who have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, people who have experienced your amazing grace, your redemption, who have been washed whiter than snow. And because of the finished work of Christ, and the veil being torn, we have access this morning into the Holy of Holies. And we come boldly, as the author of Hebrews says, into this holy place, approaching the throne of God with the needs that we have. Father, in our church family, we have many who are sick, many who are going through difficult circumstances. Lord, in life, many who have tests and procedures and things going on. Father, we all have people in our lives who are struggling. And, and Father, it breaks our heart. We bring all of these things before you this morning. We trust you to meet the needs that we have according to your riches and glory, which are absolute and endless. Father, we ask that you would visit here with us today. God, that your Holy Spirit would move in our hearts, move on our minds. Lord, that you would transform us through the power of your word and even through the message of a, a flawed messenger. We pray for salvation today. That if there's any person who does not have a saving and personal redemptive relationship with you, whether they're in person here or watching online, that today would be that day that they bend their knee to a sovereign God and embrace the gift of salvation that's made available only through a relationship with Jesus. For those of us who know you, Lord, we ask that you would draw us closer to you than we've ever been before. We do pray, Father, for our community. We pray for our nation. We pray for its leaders, our military, our missionaries all over the world who are preaching the gospel today. We pray for our sister churches right here in our community. We ask that you would send revival just as we ask that you'd send revival to us. Father, we ask today as we've gathered that you would be big, that you'd be exalted, and that you'd be lifted up. We acknowledge this morning an enemy not flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, and rulers of this dark age. We pray as this enemy seeks to devour, that you would protect our families who are under attack. You would protect marriages here in our church family. You would protect relationships, protect the fidelity of, of our church. Help us to be ever gospel-centered and word-focused. Father, we confess this morning that though Satan is strong, he is a defeated foe, and Jesus Christ is our Lord. And we ask this in His holy and precious name. And if you agree with me in prayer, would you say amen? amen.
So today is, is Palm Sunday, and uh, it's a day that we remember Jesus coming into Jerusalem and people shouting Hosanna and celebrating his coming. And this song I'm singing today is uh, not about that day, but it is about a day when Jesus is coming, uh, when he's going to come back and, and bring us all to him. Uh, it's a wonderful day of celebration that that day, Palm Sunday, only like brings a small shadow compared to the joy and uh, the jubilation that we'll experience that day. So this is The King is Coming. The marketplace is empty, no more traffic in the streets. All the builders' tools are silent, no more time to harvest wheat. Busy housewives cease their labors in the courtroom, no debate, work on earth. Suspended as the king comes through the gate. Happy faces line the hallways. Those whose lives have been redeemed. Broken homes that he has mended. Those from prison he has freed. Little children and the aged, hand in hand. Thank you, Brother Michael. If you keep working at it, you might end up a singer, son. <laughs> Man, I'm grateful that the King is coming. Amen? He is longing and looking for that day. In just a few moments, we're going to join together in Luke's Gospel, so you can go ahead and turn there. That's where we're going to be preaching from this morning, the Gospel of Luke. Now, as Michael mentioned, uh, it is Palm Sunday, and uh, traditionally, uh, I would preach a, a Sunday sermon that has to do with Palm Sunday, but uh, we're not led by tradition, we're led by the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to preach a sermon this morning, not on Palm Sunday, uh, but I'm going to preach a sermon this morning on the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you're a guest here with us, I joke around a lot. We have a lot of fun, and that's okay. It's okay to smile. It's okay. Did y'all know it's okay to laugh at church? It's, it's just fine. Uh, the Christian ought to be the happiest people on earth. There, there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But I'll, I'll tell you this morning, uh, it's, it's going to be a little somber, maybe even a little heavy, as we lean into the cross this morning. 
There's some Im images that are difficult to see, but they're too significant for us to ignore. Um, early on in my own ministry, I got some great advice from my mentor. Uh, he explained to me that as a pastor that I'm going to encounter uh, some, some very distinct and different moments that maybe not everyone has the privilege of encountering. I, I'm going to be with people and call, be called to be with people in their finest hour, in their finest moments, in the, those high points of life. That might be to officiate a wedding where a husband and wife are joined together in matrimony, two becoming one flesh. It might be to, to welcome a, a newborn baby to the world and, and celebrate that. It might be for uh, a celebration of certain milestones or achievements, uh, promotions or, or graduations, and, and I'll get to be with people in some of their higher points, some of the finest moments, but he said you'll also, you'll also be with people during their lowest points, some of the most difficult moments of their life that may be that you're called to, to sit with the dying in their hospital room. It, it could be you're called to an accident scene. To pray with people who are, are gravely, morbidly injured. Could be occasions where you're called to break the worst possible news to a family that, that they could ever expect and then expected to, to remain there with the family to serve as a comfort. And he said all of those things are going to happen and, and he was right, they have. Each and every one on multiple occasions. But he said, here's a word of advice. When those moments come and those difficult scenes begin to unfold, there'll be some images that, that you're going to be faced with, things you'll never be able to forget. He said, here's my word of advice to you. Don't look away. Don't look away. Your tendency is going to be to look away, but don't do it. You look them right in the eyes, they grieve. You look them in the eyes, they hurt. You look them in the eyes, they die. For in those moments, they need someone who can connect with them. Someone who could empathize with them. That advice is something that I'm extraordinarily glad that, that I took years ago. That, that I didn't look away. Not only did it bring some measure of, of solace to those that I was ministering to, but it's also helped to shape who I am. Shape the way I see the world. It has helped to shape how I minister in it. I'm going to make a big statement to you this morning before we jump into the Word. Sometimes the most difficult images can be the catalyst for the most significant life changes. If only we resist the urge to look away. Such is the case with the cross. The cross is bloody. It's a gnarly scene. It's, it's, it's an awful, terrifying image. And over the centuries, we, we've attempted to make it a little more docile, maybe a little more palatable. We've, we've turned it into a, 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 an elegant image to put at the end of a gold chain and wear around our neck. We, we've decided to make it a symbol, and, and we've tattooed it on our arms. And during the Easter, Easter season, we'll often decorate the, the cross with flowers, and, and it's beautiful. And that's just human nature because we don't like being uncomfortable. We don't like being uncomfortable at all. And the cross is just that. It's uncomfortable. But as Christians, we, we know that this, this, this cross, this scene, this image of a cross, we know that it's an image that's difficult. We, we know that it's painful for us to see. But we also know that we can't look away. We can't turn from it because in that cross, as bloody and gnarly and ugly as it is, in that cross, our faith rests. Our eternity rests. The cross is important. This morning, I don't want us to paint a domesticated picture of the cross. I want us to see it for the horrific image that it actually was. And as we paint this picture of the cross through the scriptures, I want to caution you not to look away. Though we'll have that temptation. Don't let your mind travel. Don't let it wander. Instead, as we see the cross for what it was this morning, I want to encourage you to gaze at it. 
to focus on it, to let it transform you, to let it wreck you, to let it make you uncomfortable. And as we do this, we're going to find a story of salvation. We're going, to, we're going to find that because of this cross and all of its bloody glory, it's never too late for someone to be saved and transformed by the power of the gospel. Let me give you some context before we jump into the gospel of Luke. Throughout history, man has devised hundreds if not thousands of ways to kill one another. That's what we do. That's depravity on display. But none of the ways that man's come up with to kill one another could rival crucifixion as far as bringing about a slow and painful death. According to the ancient Greek historian Herodotus, in an effort to most severely punish their enemies, the Persians are credited, if you will, with inventing the process of crucifixion after experimenting with other forms of execution, such as drowning and burning, strangulation and flaying. In the end, crucifixion became their tool of choice, not only because it inflicted the most amount of torture imaginable, but it also allowed them to appease their quote-unquote God or who was the God of the ground. The body was suspended so that it wouldn't defile that ground. The practice of crucifixion was adopted eventually by Alexander the Great. He used it as a tool for warfare. The four generals that would follow Alexander the Great continued that practice, followed eventually by the Carthaginians. By the time Rome had risen to prominence and power, crucifixion was widely used as a form of capital punishment. It was reserved, though, for the worst of the worst. It was reserved for rebels and runaway slaves. It was used for deserting Roman soldiers. Rome used it to continue to kind of maintain law and order in Rome. You see, while capital punishment is still used in some states here in the United States as, as a form of execution, it's always a private matter. It's always behind closed doors. There are never cameras in place. There's not a watching world. There's only a select few who will be be able to be there in the room as capital punishment takes place in the United States, but not so in Rome. Crucifixion was a public spectacle. They made it as terrible as possible and as big of an event as possible in order to deter any would-be criminals or rebels from getting any ideas. It was a tool for law and order. So while the Romans did not invent crucifixion, I want you to understand this morning that they did perfect it. They did perfect it. Leading every crucifixion was a man employed by Rome. He was paid handsomely by Rome. He was called the exactor mortis. The exactor mortis, that means the supervisor of death. He had a team of, of skilled surgeons, if you will, to bring about the most painful, torturous, prolonged death experience imaginable. They'd made it an art. Over time, through really trial and error, through experience, they'd learned to expertly control the amount that one would suffer. They'd learned to control the cause of death that one would have on the cross. They'd learned to control even when the victim would die. Typically, before a person would be crucified, he endured a beating by a flagrum. This was done by a man, again, employed by Rome, called the lictor. The severity of that beating would usually determine how long the victim would live on the cross. If the exactor mortis, if he desired that a prisoner die quickly, as in the case of Jesus, we'll see more about this next week on Easter Sunday and, and why there was a, a desire for Jesus to die quickly. The exactor mortis would direct the lictor to use a scourge. It's a, it's a leather strap with multiple leather tongs coming off of it. He would choose one that had jagged bits of sheep bones and, and glass and marbles braided into the tails of the whip. On the other hand, if the exactor mortis wanted the victim to last several days on the cross, historians tell us some would even last more than a week on the cross, you would choose a light scorch with simple leather straps. I'm telling you, they had it down to a science. They knew how to take a man to the very brink of death without killing him. After the lictor completed his, his cruel task, the exactor mortis and this, this team of death dealers who worked for him would strip the prisoner naked and force him to carry the, the beam of their cross to their place of execution. 
this giant beam of wood would be strapped to his back and a sign called a titulus would be hung around his neck and on this sign it's nothing more than a crude board of wood they would have the title of those who were being executed and the crimes to which they were being executed for. The beam that he would carry, it didn't carry the entire cross. I know what the movies tell us, but it didn't carry the entire cross. It would carry just the, the beam over his shoulders. The, the entire cross would weigh upwards of 300 pounds. And uh, even a man who had not been beaten would have a struggle carrying something like that through the streets to his death. With the beam of the cross on his shoulders, and the tittle of sign hanging around his neck, the one being executed would start a slow, long death march through the busiest ports of the city. This is eventually called the Via Dolorosa. It's the way of suffering. It had given that title and that name. The purpose of that march, of course, was to enhance the public spectacle of it all. To ensure that more people see what's going on. Again, to deter any would-be rebels or would-be criminals from committing crimes because they didn't want that to be their fate as well. During the final trial of our Lord Jesus, the lictor, had taken Jesus to the very brink of death. He'd used one of, those, one of those whips with sheep bones, jagged sheep bones braided into the leather. Marble braided into the leather. Fragments of glass braided into the leather. His body and his face had become so mangled by this beating, that so, so trashed and thrashed by this beating that he was not even recognizable. The prophet Isaiah tells us in Isaiah chapter 52, verse number 13, that his appearance, his, his, the way that he looked, our Lord Jesus, his appearance was so disfigured, disfigured beyond that of any human likeness, any human form. His form marred beyond human likeness. He was not distinguishable. He was beaten to a pulp. He didn't even look human. That's what Isaiah was telling us about this coming Messiah and the suffering that he would endure. By the time Jesus was handed over to the exactor mortis by the lictor to begin his death march, to have the beam strapped over his back and to have the sign hang over his neck, he would not have been able to carry the cross very far. In fact, he didn't. He began to carry that cross. Some historians say that he carried it for a while and then he ended up dragging it for a while. But in time, the soldiers who were marching with Jesus to his place of death grew impatient. And they found a man who was in the crowd named Simon of Cyrene. And, and they brought him out to carry this beam for the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the titulus, the sign that was hanging around his neck, wasn't appreciated either. The religious leaders, the Jews of the day, they, they, they rejected the sign that Pilate had written and hung around the neck of Jesus. Pilate had written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, Jesus the Nazarene, and under that, the, the crime by which he was being committed or being crucified for, the king of the Jews. They were fearful that some Jews might take this literally. So those Jewish leaders demanded that Pilate change it to read, called himself a king of the Jews. Pilate refused to change it. In John chapter 19, verse number 22, he said, What I have written, I've written. With the beam attached to his shoulders. The, the titulus hanging around his neck. Jesus began his slow death march through the Via Dolorosa, through the busy streets of Jerusalem. Already tied and already crowded in Jerusalem, th these winding alleys would have been more crowded than usual. It would have been hard to walk through their period, much less with a beam strapped across your back because it was the Passover festival. Jerusalem was packed with people who have come for the feast and for the festivals there in Jerusalem. So there, in your mind's eye, here's Jesus. He's beaten to the point of being unrecognizable, not only as himself, his identity, but even as a human being. He's stripped naked. 
to enhance the shame and the spectacle. He's making his way through this huge crowd as they hurl insults at him with, without any measures of mercy. And after this long, painful, methodical journey through the crowded streets of Jerusalem, he reaches a hill that the locals call Golgotha. It was called Golgotha because it looked, it was shaped as a skull. Golgotha means the place of the skull. The beam would have been laid on the ground as he reached his place of execution. It would have been attached to an, another a longer beam called a stipes. It would be a horizontal beam when it's raised up. Per the custom of the day, Jesus would be offered a mild painkiller. And make no mistake, it wasn't an act of mercy in any way, shape, or form. It was just expediency, for it would be much easier to fasten somebody to a cross if they were drugged. But the Bible tells us in Mark chapter 15, verse 23, And they gave him to drink wine, wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. Jesus refused the painkiller. Most often, the victims of crucifixion would have been tied to the cross. Again, this is not an act of mercy. They were tied to the cross because it would prolong their death. Again, historians tell us that some who were tied to the cross would last on the cross for several days, even more than a week's time, as they suffered. But the exactor mortis, desiring Jesus' death to be a quick one, to get this whole ordeal over with, to, to shut the Jews up, to, to cause no more trouble so we just get on with our lives. He wanted Jesus' death to be a quick one. So instead of rope, he used nails. Nails were used to secure our Lord Jesus to the cross. Again, the exactor mortis was a doctor of death. He had perfected the, the art of torture. As a soldier would, would lay across the chest of Jesus, another soldier would take spikes which were five inches long and three-eighths of an inch square, and they would be driven through the base of each palm, and they would exit the wrist. The reason they were positioned in this way was twofold. One, it was the only way that the human body could actually support the weight of the victim. And the second reason is far more sinister. It was driven through the base of the palm and exited through the wrist because there, and only there, it would have to pass through the median nerve, inflicting the most severe pain and torture imaginable. His knees were then bent slightly. His feet were, were placed flat against that main beam, and nails again were driven into his feet. And now securely nailed to the cross, the soldiers would take this, this now fastened cross and they would guide it to uh, the base of a hole that was probably somewhere between four and five feet deep and, and tilt it up and it, it would fall to the earth with a jarring thud. Then they would drive wedges into the ground between the the beam and the ground to secure it in place. With the cross secure and, and Jesus hanging there like a piece of butcher's meat before the crowd who was mocking soldiers who were laughing, religious leaders who were sneering, he offered a, a quiet prayer. Luke chapter 23 verse 34, forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. The next little while, to be quite honest with you, is excruciating to think about, to, to deliberate in our, in our minds, but, but we must. We, we must, as we prepare for Easter Sunday. We must deliberate this. We must think about it. We must let it, let it bring discomfort to us. We know that about a half hour into crucifixion, about a half hour after a victim is lifted up into position on the cross, their, their forearms begin to swell and they begin to feel numb. And the weight of their bodies make it feel like the shoulders are, are being ripped from their sockets. And there's only one way to relieve the, the pressure and the pain that's felt in the arms and in the, in the shoulders. The only way to do it is to instinctively push up with their legs. 
temporary relief. I say temporary because eventually their legs would begin to fatigue. They'd begin to cramp. And then they would have to again use their arms to support their weight. And then their arms would hurt and their shoulders would begin to burn and they would lift up with their legs and it was an ongoing process that would continue for the hours or even days that they were on across a constant state of, of painful motion. History tells us that death usually came through dehydration or in most cases through asphyxia. The victim's constant movement, constant torture, it would eventually leave him too exhausted to even find his next breath, and he would simply suffocate. Shortly after 9 o'clock in the morning, on Good Friday, Jesus hung there. Think about it. Suspended just a few feet from the very earth that he had created. This is going to be different. Would you close your eyes for a moment? Picture it. Picture the Savior of the world hanging on a cruel cross. See the blood trickle down His emaciated body. See the nails driven through His hands and through His feet. See the wounds and the lacerations that, that would have made His body unrecognizable. See the, the smug grin on the faces of the religious leaders who are there on that day. Listen to the sound of the crowd as they laugh. The children cheer as He coughs up blood. Listen to the argument that's going on between the soldiers as to which would be getting the clothes that were stripped from his body. Listen to the wails and the moans of his mother as she watched her son die. Listen to the sound of a dying king gasping for air. Just sit there a moment in that. That seems difficult, isn't it? That seems hard. It's uncomfortable. And the tendency that we have is to look away. To, to hide our eyes. To, to fill our minds with something more palatable. Something more docile. But if we look away, we miss the wonder of the cross. If we look away, we miss the beauty. If we look away, we'll miss the love and we'll miss the grace. With that said, look with me at Luke chapter 22. Because I want to show you what's lovely about this scene. As ugly as it is, as gnarly as it is, I want to share with you what's beautiful about this scene. In Luke 22, verses 32 and 33, the Bible says, and there were also two other malefactors, led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, they were crucified with him. And the malefactors went on the right hand and the other on the left. Here beside Jesus, we find two other men. Who were they? Who were these male factors? Who were these men who were hanging on the cross beside Jesus? Well, the Bible doesn't say. The Bible doesn't give us a name or an address. And, and we're not going to make any assumptions. Where the Bible speaks, we're going to speak. Where it's silent, we need always be silent. The King James uses the term here, male factors. This is loosely translated criminals. Some translations you may have one with you that would use the term thieves. Two thieves hung beside Jesus on a cross, but these were no common thieves. Remember, crucifixion was reserved for a select group. 
Crucifixion was reserved for the worst of the worst. Roman tradition alludes to the fact that these men were probably foot soldiers of Barabbas. Barabbas, you'll remember, was a notorious insurrectionist, a brutal criminal, an awful rebel. Barabbas was the one who was supposed to be crucified that day alongside them. In fact, Pilate, just, just a little bit before our scene, Pilate had come out to the Jews, not desiring to have Jesus crucified because Pilate could find no fault in that man. And he offered up Barabbas to the Jews and said, you could crucify him. Crucify Barabbas. And they said, we don't want Barabbas. We don't want Barabbas. We want Jesus. Pilate washed his hands, Brother Cleland. See, the blood's on your hands. They cried out, let his blood be on our children and our grandchildren. We want Jesus. History tells us that these men were probably at least contemporaries of Barabbas, probably his foot soldiers. We don't know exactly. We just know these were terrible, terrible men. And it may appear as we look at these two terrible men who are being crucified for their crimes and justly crucified for their crimes, it may appear as though these two men are exactly alike. They're both notorious criminals. They're both sentenced to death, to die in the worst way imaginable. Like Jesus, both of these men would have been beaten and they would have been stripped naked before they hung on a cross. Like Jesus, both of these men would have carried the beam of their own crosses down the Via Dolorosa. Like Jesus, both of these men would have had a sign hanging around their neck with their identity and then the crimes for which they were being crucified for. Both of these men were dying. Both of these men would soon be dead. If you looked at both of these men on this day on the cross, you could really tell no difference between them. No discernible difference. But there was one. There was one huge difference. And this was a difference that made all the difference. So though you could look at these two men hanging and not know what the difference between based upon appearance, here's the difference in these two men. The difference was how each of these two men viewed the one who was hanging between them. One wanted escape, not forgiveness. The other desired forgiveness not escape. In Luke 23, verses 39 through verse 43, the Bible says, And one of the male factors which hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God? seeing that thou art in the same condemnation and indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. He said nothing unto Jesus, Lord. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. That story at that cross it, it is a wonderful reminder that though the scene is gruesome, the significance is glorious. If you're taking notes, jot a couple of things down. Things that, that this scene reminds us of as we approach the Holy Week. We approach the celebration of Resurrection Day. First of all, we have in this scene a reminder that the gospel, the gospel is simple. The gospel is simple. I want you to think about this church. Think about this for a moment. Think about this man who is hanging beside Jesus on this cross and cries out for salvation. I want you to think about the fact that this man had none of the advantages that the disciples had. 
He had none of the advantages that you and I have today. As far as we can tell, this man was not present for the Sermon on the Mount. He, he wasn't there with the Sea of Galilee in the background as Jesus taught about the kingdom. He wasn't present for that. As far as we could tell, this man had never seen Jesus heal the sick or raise the dead or give sight to blind eyes or making the, the dumb speak or open the ears of those who could not hear. As far as we could tell, this man knew nothing of the virgin birth or the Old Testament prophecies that we looked at last week concerning our Lord Jesus. This man was not privy to the conversation that Jesus had had with Nicodemus on, on the need to be born again. He could not debate the finer points of theology. Also, when we have to look at this man, there was nothing about him that he could point to in his own life and say, See, I deserve heaven. Look at what I've done. Look at what I've given. Look at who I've helped. Look at the attitude that I've carried myself with, how, how good, well-mannered that I am. There was nothing that this man could, could point to and say, I deserve paradise, I deserve forgiveness, I deserve redemption, I deserve heaven. He was a bona fide thug. That's all he was. That's all that he had ever been. He had not lived a righteous day in his adult life. He couldn't say... Jesus, remember me, I'm a church member. By the way, coming to church makes one a Christian as much as standing in a garage makes him a car. He couldn't say, remember me, Lord, I, I'm, I'm a church member. He couldn't say, remember me, Father, I'm baptized. He couldn't say, remember me, Lord, I partook of the, the Lord's Supper or I went on the mission trip or I put a big check in the offering plate at the end of the service. He, he couldn't say any of those things. This man was being executed for his sins. And he even acknowledges in our text, even acknowledges in the Scriptures that he was getting exactly what he deserved. This was not a good man. This was not a wise man. This was, this was not a Bible man. But in this mess of a man, we find one of the most amazing examples of saving faith in the entire Bible. You see, though this man could not quote the Old Testament... Though this man could not name the disciples, this man couldn't pick Jesus out of a lineup before this day. There on the cross, this crucified man saw another crucified man, and hear me, he believed in him. He believed in him. He came to understand the, the simple gospel. The heart of this simple gospel. And because of that, he offers a short prayer. What was his prayer? Remember me when thou comest unto thy kingdom. That's a bit unusual, isn't it? That prayer. That's a, that's a bit strange. It's not the typical prayer that we think about when, when we are, are counseling people to come to Christ. That's usually not the prayer that we might, we might counsel them to pray. But that's the prayer that he offers. And in that, I'm reminded, and, and, and this is a blessing for me, I'm reminded that God does not judge the style in which we pray, but the sincerity. And that's exactly what he is. This criminal didn't know all the right words to say, but what he said was good enough because he was saying it to the right person. Amen? When he said, Lord... When you come into your kingdom, remember me. He didn't even know exactly what he was asking for. But before sundown, he would receive more than he ever expected. I'm so grateful for the simplicity of the gospel. It doesn't take a scholar to come to Christ. You say, well, I don't understand all there is to know about this Bible. I don't either. I've been preaching it 20 years. In fact, it's, it's not the parts that I don't understand that cause me trouble. It's what I do sometimes. I don't, I don't understand all there is to know about this book or, or about the majesty of the king. I don't, I don't get it all. But I know this. The Bible says that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
It's a simple gospel. It's believing that Jesus is who he said he was. That he did what he said he did. And it's trusting him and that finished work for eternal life. That's a simple gospel. The promise that we have here in this prayer is wonderful. And Jesus answered to that prayer. Listen to what he says today. Thou shalt be with me in paradise. And notice the immediacy today. He doesn't say to this criminal, after a while you shall be with me in paradise. After a period of soul sleep you shall be with me in paradise. He says, today thou shall be with me in paradise. What a promise that is. What a, what a hope bringing promise that is. What a comforting thought for someone like me or, or, and I know many of you who have lost a loved one who is a believing loved one to know that today that day, that moment when I was with my dad and he passed away, he closed his eyes in death and he opened them in eternal life. Today you will be with me in paradise. It echoes what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 8 to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Praise God. Praise God for the immediacy. He says with par you'll be with me in paradise. In the original Greek language, this term with me, it means side by side. A personal presence. It's not you'll be there and somewhere I'll be there. No, no. It's with me side by side. Sometimes we get so bogged down about the little details that are really unknowable about this place called heaven that we miss the big picture. Listen, the best thing about heaven is not gates of pearl. The best thing about heaven is not streets of gold. The best ha thing about heaven is not even reunions with love. The best thing about heaven is Jesus. He's the best thing about heaven. Look at, it. Look at it this way. When I'm away from home for a while, I get to missing home. I'm a homebody. I like to be home. I, don't like, I, I get tired of being on vacation. I got to get home. I like it. When I'm away for a while, I'll say that I can't wait to go home. When I say I can't go wait to go home, I'm not saying I can't wait to see the bricks. I can't, I can't wait to, to touch my carpet. I can't wait to come in and give my curtains a great big hug. I say I can't wait to get home because Annette's there. Kaylin is there. Caden is there. Kendall is there. My dog Jep's there. It's home because who's there? When I say I can't wait to get home, that's what I mean. Listen, heaven is glorious because of who's there. When we, when we on Wednesday night were preaching through Revelation, we said, I can't wait to go home. What we're saying is, I can't wait to see Jesus. Amen? I, I can't wait for my faith to become sight. Heaven is home because Jesus is there. Lastly, this text tells us that, man, this is, I'm not a good preacher, but this is good preaching. This text tells us that it's not too late. It's not too late. M m many of you, myself as well, and you've talked with me, many of you talked to me personally about having a loved one who's lost. It's a spouse, a mother, father, a child, family member, a friend, a teammate. We've prayed together for their salvation and we often get discouraged. We often get discouraged because of the depths of sin that they have plunged to. And if we're not careful, we'll say things like this. He's, he's just too far gone or, or it's just too late for her. If this story reminds us of anything, at the cross we learn that no one is ever too far gone. Amen? It's never too late as long as they've got enough breath in them to whisper a prayer. Yes, this man, this man did not do things right. He would have been much wiser years ago to receive Christ as his Lord and, and live in power and glory, be a kingdom-minded. It would have been much better. So yes, yes, he waited until the last second. But do not forget, in that last second, he was saved. He was clean. He was set free. I want to encourage you to take this story, if nothing else, and allow it to encourage you to keep praying for that one who's lost, who don't know Jesus. To, to keep sharing this good news with them. It's also possible that you could be here this morning in person or, or watching online and you identify with the man on the cross. You've lived rough. 
You've hurt others. You've been arrogant, addicted, awful. Let me state this plainly. It's not too late for you. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how far you've run. It doesn't matter how ugly you've been. If this man could be saved, anyone can. If there's hope for this man, there's hope for you. If Jesus would redeem this man and welcome him into glory, he'll do the same as you. He'll give you eternal life as well. Just don't look away. Would you bow with me? With heads bowed and eyes closed, we're going to have a hymn of response. I encourage you during this time, think about that cross. And all of its brutality to think about that cross. And don't look away. Think about that thief. Think about the life he now has. Not because of anything he's done, but because of that cross. Because Jesus did for him what he couldn't do for himself. He paid that penalty. He did the same for us all. This morning, if you would like to give your life to Jesus, you don't have to pray an eloquent prayer. Gracious sakes, he didn't. Listen, you'll never impress God with your oratory prayer skills. It's just a simple prayer. Lord, I acknowledge I'm a sinner. I can't make up for that. I can never make myself right with you. But I trust that Jesus is who he says he is. I give my heart to him. I ask to be forgiven. If you'll do that with sincerity, you'll be born again. And you can know that if... If your number's up tomorrow, you will be with Jesus in paradise. What a joy that is. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for time in the Word today. And Father, it has been a heavy time that we've been in together. The Holy Spirit has, has certainly been moving. But thank you, Lord, for reminding us of the truth of the cross. It's not palatable. It's not comfortable. It's everything but that. And because it's everything but that, it gives us life. God, I thank you for paying the price for my sins. For, for dying the death that I deserve. Help me to live my life with that at the forefront of my mind. In Jesus' name, amen.